I, my name is Eta Keuchi. I'm the Vice uh, Rector of uh, United Nations University. I would like to, on behalf of the United Nations, deliver a welcome address. Thank you very much for coming uh, to uh, the university from early in the morning. This symposium uh, is a part of the uh, sustainability-related uh, international uh, conferences uh, led by United Nations University. And today's international symposium is jointly organized by Sustainability, Sustainability Science Consortium with the members of the corporate members and academic institutions. Uh, it is uh, the uh, general uh, social corporate entity. In organizing uh, this uh, symposium, Japan Science and Technology Agency and other many organizations have uh, helped us successfully plan and uh, launch the symposium. So I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the related organizations. So uh, today's uh, theme is the creation of a sustainable society in harmony with nature. As you know, in 2010, in Nagoya, in Aichi Prefecture, we had a, a COP10 related to uh, the BD, and then it out, there were two major outcomes. Uh, one uh, is the Nagoya Protocol for share profit sh sharing, and then we had a short-term goal for 2020, and then long-term goals for 2050. So we adapted Aichi targets, Aichi goals. In order to achieve the short-term uh, goals, we are launching various initiatives. And then we had a common goals for 2050 as well. So under uh, the initiative of the Japanese government, by 2050, we are upholding the goal to create a sustainable society in harmony with nature. In 2007, when a policy to create a country based on tourism, this word was uh, used for the first time. Human beings and the nature must create a very good and harmonious relationship in order to create the sustainable society in harmony with nature. Uh, for one, as a, a keynote speaker, we have very famous uh, professor Das Gupta, and there are increasing interest in the society in harmony with nature. In 2012, in Rio, we had a Rio Plus 20 conference during which Inclusive Wealth Index was published, about which uh, we will hear uh, further details today from Professor Dasgupta, and uh, we will hear that the natural capital is quite important, and natural capital must be well utilized for our living. And uh, that is the common ideas that we uphold today. And then ecosystem service is a key word, and it can be understood as a blessings of nature. In order to utilize the blessings of nature, scientific evaluation and the utilization of the results of the evaluation uh, would be crucial in the international uh, society. In order to pursue uh, such initiatives, we have a global level initiatives one of which uh, is about biodiversity and ecosystem service. And it's 
there is a, a platform called Intergovernmental Science Pol Policy Platform on Divers Diversity and Ecosystem service Services. And we have a privilege of having Professor Zakri as one of the speakers. Recently, we had the uh, IP Best General Assembly in Germany, uh, in Bonn specifically, and he is going to give us more information about uh, the general uh, conference, general meeting. So today's theme, once again, uh, is the harmony with nature, not only in acad amongst academia, but in uh, industry, we have to create collaboration uh, in order to achieve a sustainable society in harmony with nature. So from in and outside Japan, we have uh, distinguished experts to speak about this important theme. So today during the symposium, uh, we will hear a lot of uh, recommendations from experts around the world. So it's going to be a long uh, symposium, but I hope you will stay until the end, and also I hope you will participate actively. Which preserves the ability of future generations to inherit um, the, the productive capacity that we have uh, inherited ourselves. But growth in what? It's all well to say that we want a green economy and thereby we need a measure to see whether the economy is kept green, the natural, or maybe greener, or maybe whatever. But the thing is, what is, it that, what is that object that we want to see be enhanced? Now there, what we are faced with is a choice of two routes to follow. One could be to say, well, look, all this is sophistry. What we want is that human well-being is preserved and maintained and enhanced. We want our children to enjoy a better life than we do. And presumably, they themselves would want to have their children enjoy a life better than them, or at least no worse than them. So we should be looking for the ends of development. And green, you could use green or brown or any other shade, but what you really care about is human well-being. So we could measure the thing in terms of the ends. Alternatively, the other route is to say, well, suppose instead we search for the means to carry out those ends, to meet those ends. Means means the wherewithal for achieving those ends. If we have found the right means to the ends that we care about, then it doesn't matter whether you're measuring the means or whether you're measuring the ends. Because either way, you'll get the right answer. Now, it so happens, experience and theory both tell us that it is most often easier to measure the means to study the means than it is to study the ends. Of course, the two are connected. Without knowing what the ends are, you wouldn't know what the means are, or at least in the sense that you won't be able to value the means, see the worth of the means. So there's a connection, of course, but it turns out that it's much easier to measure the means. Now you can see I'm coming full circle to what the Brundtland Commission talked about in 1987 when they talked about sustainable development. They, didn't, they were concerned with bestowing to the next generation the means that they need to further their ends. That's ex exactly the, I'm almost paraphrasing what they had written. The problem with the Brundtland Commission report, however, the brilliant report it was, pioneering altogether, was that it didn't spell out how to measure the means. Uh, it had a notion of sustainability, but it didn't tell us what it is that we should measure and keep an eye on to ensure that productive capacity of the economy continues to expand. So they did identify 
that the, main, the productive capacity of an economy to be the means. So you hand over to the next generation a productive capacity which enables you to produce things, enjoy life, and so forth. And that's the means. Question, how do we measure it? And the Brunton Commission report didn't provide much of a clue. Now, you might say, forget about Brundtland for the moment, you might say, so you could say that, look, if it's depreciation of capital that you are worried about, wear and tear of buildings, the fact that people die, the fact that natural capital can be destroyed and is being destroyed, why not replace the good old measure that we use, namely gross domestic product, which is the coin by which we decide on the success or failure of economies these days, why not turn that and remove depreciation of capital from GDP? Well, why wouldn't that do the trick? So the idea could be that we should measure net domestic product and see, track that over time and see if, if that doesn't re reduce, then all is well. And that is a thought. Remember how I'm guiding you. I started with depreciation being the source of a problem. And now I'm saying that, well, all right, if it's a source of the problem, knock it out of something we already know, which is gross domestic product. What's wrong with that? Well, it turns out to be a wrong idea. And the right, I mean, I will really talk about the right idea instead, without going into why that's a wrong idea. Then I'll show you how to use the wrong idea and make it right. Okay? If the objective of development is to further intergenerational well-being, by which I mean well-being of us, our children, grandchildren, and so forth, then it can be shown that the measure of the means toward the ends is an inclusive measure of an economy's wealth. And I will use the term per capita because you want to normalize, take into account the fact that population changes in composition and size. So when I say wealth, you can talk about the uh, per capita wealth and also, of course, the distribution of wealth. Just as you talk about the distribution of income, I can talk about the distribution of wealth as well. The key question is, what does wealth consist of? Now notice, when you talk about, you think about your own wealth, and you say, how wealthy am I? You don't ask, what is my income? You ask, what is the value of the assets I hold? The shares I have, the house I own. And if you're really into economics, you'll say, and what about the flow of salary I'll be enjoying till I retire? discount that back, that's part of my wealth. And indeed it is, because you're, uh, you know that's your income flow, and bringing that income flow back to the present contributes to your sense of wealth. So we know what wealth is, or at least we think we know what wealth is. It's a stock, it's the value of the assets you own. But now we're talking about a society, and we have recognized that Things are trickier uh, than for the person. So I'm going to now talk about capital assets. We, the wealth is the value of the capital assets that an economy has access to. Notice, I didn't say owns, has access to. An economy has access to the atmosphere, has access to the open oceans, it doesn't own either of them. In fact, lack of ownership is presumably one of the problems that we feel we can discharge carbon free of charge and take as many oceanic tours we like and, and pollute it. Okay? Now, what are capital assets? You want to say that the wealth we are talking about is the value of capital assets, so we need to know what they are and we need to classify them. Okay, so here's a classification. Reproducible capital, that's the old-fashioned capital assets, roads, buildings, ports, machines, equipment. Then there is this object which we now take very seriously. Uh, about four, four decades ago, four or five decades ago, it entered economics, and now it is a commonplace idea that the wealth of a nation also includes human capital. 
It's an appealing thought because it, people matter. But here the idea is that people matter because they're also the means to their own welfare. So education can be seen as a means. Of course, education is also a good thing in the sense that you want an educated public, you can read great works and so forth. But I'm not talking about education as a skill. Okay. And then, of course, health. I won't belabor it. These are two obvious types of capital assets. And the third is what we are discussing here today, and the whole symposium is about natural capital. And here I talk, I want to include, of course, ecosystems, the atmosphere, subsoil resources. On the whole, subsoil resources are not that much of a problem because people had access to them and privatized them. There are prices for it. Of course, there's no prices for the pollution that is discharged out of it, but that's a different matter. So the price of, say, for example, oil should be a lot higher if you want to follow Pigou, because burning it is causing a damage, and that should be a price tagged to the producer. It's ecosystems which are really problematic. What by problematic, I mean it's out there as an invisible, quote, unquote, uh, object. Of course, it's all too visible, but the services are invisible. Most urban people do not know the value of poll pollination, for example. You may have read about it when you were a kid in school that bees pollinate, but our attitude to bees is to shut them out, kill them if they're... But of course, they are doing enormously valuable service, as do birds, insects, Lord knows what else. So that's a three-way sum. Now, and I'll say it, let's suppose we think of the wealth of a nation as being the value, the social value, the social worth of these three types. You could then say, there is something dreadfully wrong in what I'm saying. What's that? You will say, well, what about all the other kinds of capital assets we talk about? Institutions, social capital, codified knowledge. We think of institutional capital these days. We talk about social capital, norms, habitual practices, the extent of trust among people. We sometimes use the term religious capital. Anything that is durable, we tend to use the term capital for it. And you could be asking, shouldn't these also belong to the, be included in our notion of wealth through their being classified as capital assets. In other words, why have I excluded these assets, which I'm calling enabling assets, from the first group? And the reason is, and you'll be glad to know that one can even prove it, so it's not an intuition, well, I had the intuition, but it can be proved, that up to a point it doesn't matter how you classify assets. This is one of convenience. I want to think of the social, and the re, for convenience because of measurement reasons. Try and measure the amount of trust in a society. What on earth does it mean? But you do know that it's a very valuable thing. It's the glue which keeps a society from crumbling. So it's extremely important. But what would it mean to say it's $700 billion of trust? It's a meaningless or near meaningless notion. So the idea really is that these, what I'm calling enabling assets, are a bit like the, think of it as a social environment in which these capital assets get allocated, accumulated, decumulated, and so forth. So if, for example, structure of property rights are very bad, very weak, largely because, let us say, you're in a civil war, or you've got an incredibly corrupt government, then the value of the, these capital assets will be lower than they would be otherwise. So you can now see where I'm heading. Then enabling assets confer value to the capital assets. The worth of this table, the desk, the podium here, depends on how it's used. Now, we happen to be privileged to be in a country which one could say is very well ordered. It's not dysfunctional. 
It's an enviable place. We know that this is not going to be destroyed just like that. But imagine a place where this happens to be, but where the people are on a rampage. Then that, the worth of this will be very low because it won't be used for, it, for its design purpose. So the enabling assets confer value to the ones I've called assets. That's one way of doing it. It's not the only way. You could take, some people would think the third, codified knowledge, natural laws, algorithms, should be regarded as capital. Because after all, here I've got skills, human capital. I've got skills in it. Well, that's knowledge. So why have I got them there and the rest elsewhere? And the reason is that the skills are embodied in people. And the, roughly speaking, there is a, quote, market for labor. So the skill that a person embodies, the value of it is to an extent reflected in hard data. Whereas Newton's differential calculus is all over, it's, it's, an, it's like an environment, it's there for us to pluck. Of course, you need the skill to be able to use it. But even if you didn't have the skills, it'd still be there. So these skills, the codified knowledge here, and skills in capital assets are complementary. Without the basic knowledge, the skills are not much use. Without the skills, the basic knowledge is not in great use. OK, so that's the setup. I won't talk about time here. You could ask me about it afterwards, but it will take us away from the main thing. So I've now got classified the assets, what we might think of assets, into two groups. Well, wealth is the social worth of an economy's stock of capital assets. An asset's social worth is called its shadow price. That the shadow prices or the social worth is the connection between the means and the ends that I began with. So ethics is very much part and parcel of what we are discussing here. Ethics drives our ends, and we are trying to translate those ends through the worth of all the stuff that we have inherited from the past and we'll be bequeathing to the future. So I've given you the formula. If PIT is the shadow price of asset I at date T, and KIT is the stock of asset I, then inclusive wealth, or wealth at T, is the sum of PIT times KIT. In other words, you sum of the values of all the assets. All right, now, I'm going to suppose that, not when I say suppose, that is what we mean. Development is sustainable if intergenerational well-being does not decline over time. So here the definition of, if you like, the green economy, or the, the economy which doesn't jeopardize the future in terms of well-being. I'm defining development in terms of the means. And here's the theorem, the proposition. It says that the intergenerational well-being increases if and only if Wealth suitably corrected for population and distribution increases. So you've got a now a nice connection between the ends and means. So if we study the means properly, we we'll can be assured that the ends are being met. And finally, I can't resist since I did introduce the notion of net domestic product. Here is the right theorem. It says wealth increases at a point in time if and only if net domestic product exceeds domestic consumption. So there's some savings. It's an intuitively good thing. It means that if there is green savings, quote unquote, in other words, savings which takes into account the three types of capital assets, maybe some are, exceed, some are uh, positive savings, the others are negative, but so long as in balance it's positive, then what you're doing is to pass on to the next generation a larger productive capacity and therefore intergenerational well-being will be higher. All right? So, the moral. Green growth should be read as growth in wealth per capita, corrected for the distribution of wealth, of course. 
I won't belabor that. That's obvious. All right? That's what we mean. We have now a sharp notion, idea, of what it is we mean when we talk about a green economy and what a green economy ought to do. It's green, only reason we mention that it's green is that all these years, all these decades, all these centuries, we have neglected the green part. Since we have introduced it, we keep on reminding ourselves that when we talk about wealth, don't forget natural capital, don't forget natural capital, don't forget natural capital. Okay, so that's, that's the only reason we call it green, or we should green. It would be lovely if one day we didn't have to use that qualifier. But we're, it'll be a long time before that happens. The problem is, of course, estimating these P's. Uh, they prove enormously problematic, and there is a deep reason why we will never get it right. There will always be assets which cannot be priced. Sacred Grove. How are you going to price it? You don't wish to price it, but we have our ways. What we do usually is to say, if that's a sacred grove, we create a fence around it. That is not to be touched. Do anything else, but don't touch that. So it comes outside the calculating system. It doesn't form part of wealth because you've protected it. You can now ignore it. Okay? I suspect that's what we'll be doing. All right. Final five minutes I have. Is this theory, the theoretical side of it is now complete. Believe me. Details need working out. And it's the practical side which is really problematic. And it is shameful that we are so slow that my profession has yet to take it seriously. But there's a glimmer of hope. There are young economists Two days ago, I heard Josh Abbott from Arizona State University present a beautiful paper in which he amalgamated ecology and demand for goods, in this case fish, fisheries, to try and estimate the shadow price of the fishery. Now, why was he doing that? Why did he have to go to ecology? We don't go to ecology when we estimate the value of this table, this desk. And the reason is that this has a market price, and we like to close our eyes and say, well, maybe that price is reflecting the social worth. But the presum and we then think that that price reflects all the technology that is at the back of the production of this object here. We don't ask, what is the engineering feats that have to be solved in order to build tables? We take the market price and run away with it. There's an implicit assumption there that somehow the price reflects all the technological costs and so forth that's involved in creating this table. The problem is there isn't a market price for fish in C2, down under. And so, to find the value of fat fish, the social worth of that fish, fishery rather, you need to go to the ecologist and say, well, how do fish grow? What's their natural reproductive rate? And so forth and so on. So there is hope. There's also hope in a different direction, which is um, IHDP with UNEP and UNU um, since 19, uh, 2012, under the leadership of Anand Durayappa, who is here, and you'll be hearing from him in a few minutes, produced the Inclusive Wealth Report. That's much more macroeconomic. It didn't go down to the Gulf of Mexico to measure the value of fish. But of course, it all should be coming together in due course. And what they did, they've just, the, se the second report has just come out uh, under Do Dr. Durayapa's uh, direction. He and, and the lead person in, in his team was Pablo Munez, and their collaborators estimated wealth per capita and its movements during 1990, 2010 in 140 countries. And in their study, they had natural capital, but a limited number, fossil fuels, minerals, agricultural land, and forests. And the way they computed the sum of the shadow prices, well, you don't want to know. Uh, but that's life. You have to start somewhere. And then human capital, education, and health. And here are the findings. And I'll conclude there. Per capita wealth grew in 85 countries and declined in 55. There was not data no data available to do the distribution of wealth, so it was in per capita terms. 
When per capita wealth change was corrected for the increase in atmospheric carbon, the price of oil, and technological change, the number of countries where per capita wealth was found to have grown dropped to 58. So 58 out of the 140 countries in the sample actually experienced a decline in wealth per capita. So the natural stock of natural capital grew in only 24 of those countries during that period. And remember, it's a very limited set of natural capital, and my strong hypothesis, and I think Dr. Deraipa will confirm that, is that there was an underestimate, not an overestimate. And that's good. To know that you are a biased result is very useful information. Because what you do is you then know that the pessimistic story that you are coming with is actually an underestimate. So we should be concerned. We should be very concerned about what we are doing to Earth and therefore what we are doing to ourselves. And if not ourselves today, ourselves tomorrow, our children, our grandchildren. And that is why it's such a, such a pleasure for me to think, now that I'm old, that there, is, there are colleagues here at UNU who are really taking the whole subject so seriously as to have started an entire movement. And there are groups, small groups, everywhere. Uh, some are more prominent than others. But together, I think we could create a movement such that my grandchildren, our grandchildren, those of us who are old enough to have grandchildren, will find that we haven't completely destroyed Earth and that there is some future for them. Thank you very much. I'm going to make this presentation on, on the behalf of myself as well as my um, comrade in arms who's not able to be here today, Pablo Munoz. Uh, and he's an integral part of this, uh, this whole report because he, he, he's the one that I kind of threw him into a room, locked the door, and said, go and get all the data for the 140 countries. Um, and then I opened the room two years later, and, and he produced a relatively good uh, data. Now, I'll tell you exactly how we can improve on that, but this is, uh, this is where we are. So this is the growth in GDP and wealth, and we're going to compare, compare the two because these are the, you know, GDP is what's been always uh, uh, tracked and monitored and reported in. So 124 of the 140 countries <coughs> experienced a positive growth in GDP, and you, and you can see, in the different color codes, uh, which are the ones that had big, more higher than 3% to 3% and those which were negative. You can see Africa is coming up uh, quite a bit, but that's no surprise and we read this on a regular basis in our newspapers and other publications. Now, if you look at the wealth, and, and Professor Dasgupta had already um, pr presented this first cut of those results, you got 86 of those 140 countries experienced positive. Now, this is basically the growth, yeah? We are not, we are not concerned about the absolute numbers. These are the growth rates over the last, um, I think it's from 1990 to 2011, for about 20 years. And so we kind of did the accumulative and then just divided this a simple, uh, simple uh, uh, average. And so this is the growth rates over those years. And so you got 86 of the 140 countries. This is, and this is per capita. And I, I emphasize the point per capita because I'm going to show in a little while how, how important population growth is, is uh, to the whole notion of sustainability. It's something that is not talked in, in, at the level that we should be talking about, but if you, you'll see that countries who have been relatively showing positive uh, growth rates in inclusive wealth get into a negative once you bring in the population. And I'll explain in a little while what that means to countries. So here you have 128 countries out of the 140 experience a positive annual average growth rate in wealth. This is per cap before per capita. So if you look at that, 128 were doing pretty well at the absolute level. Now, once you get onto a per capita, you take into account the population growth rate, you actually drop down to 85. 
So for that few countries, what it means is that their population growth rates have exceeded the growth rates in the uh, inclusive world. And so that productive base is not able to support that growth in population. In, in the very simplistic terms, that's what it's saying. And so they, get, they got two policy options. One is you address your population growth rates and you bring in a, some kind of policy to control those growth rates of the population. Or the other thing is have a look at your portfolio of assets, your productive base, and sort of see how you want to increase that growth rate. And remember, you can't just continue increasing your produced capital, which is the fastest way and the, the ones that we always focus on. So if you look at, even in Japan, if you look at the new the economic policies that have been pushed recently, it's primarily focusing on produced capital, infrastructure, buildings, bridges, and stuff. That shows a quick reaction. But with the inclusive wealth, you've got to manage the three, it's a portfolio approach. All right. And so you might find that by putting a lot in, in, into the produced capital, you might not get the returns and you might actually end up with a negative uh, inclusive wealth growth rate. So then more than half of the countries, 60% uh, are consuming beyond their means. So that's when, you, when we bring in the per capita. Now when TFP, that, uh, so that's the total factor productivity, it kind of captures the creativity, the innovation, the technological innovations that go on in a country. And, and then we added climate change and then increases in oil prices. The reason we, we did the oil prices is because there's so much fluctuations going on in the oil prices and it, it dominates so, so many of the economies around the world, either positively if you're an exporter or negatively if you're an importer, so in Japan's case, is going to have a big impact because you pretty much import most of your energy uh, in terms of oil. So only 58 of those 140 countries experience a positive growth in wealth. So let me tell you a little bit more for Japan. In a sense, I'm sure everyone, most of you are here, so, so what does that mean for Japan? Now, we did not do a ranking. All right. We, did, we, th we thought that it it's the, makes little sense to do ranking of countries. And it's, and it's unfortunate when we release the reports, the first thing reported, so, so what's the ranking like? We said, well, there is no ranking. Um, because you're looking at a country's performance against its own productive base. And that's what's most important. And those productive bases are different across countries. So you're comparing apples and oranges if you do a ranking. And we stayed out of the ranking business um, in this report. So, if you look at the, some of the key results for Japan, and I don't have it here, so I will go, I'll talk a little bit slowly and I apologize to the translators because they told me, do you have any new material? And I s kind of said no, but I think this is important to get across. So Japan is 0.9% growth rate in inclusive wealth. Right? So it's less than one. Now we are working on term of saying, so what does this mean? So I would, we were kind of classifying, and it will come out in the, in the next report once we have done a more analytical analysis of how we want to do these um, classifications, but we would put a 0.9% growth rate as one which is in a vulnerable state. It's positive, so based on the theorem, you are sustainable, but it's a vulnerable sustainability. Any perturbation, you might actually get into the negative. And part of the, and let me, uh, so, just want to say of Japan, and then with, with the adjusted total factor productivity, Japan's adjusted inclusive wealth drops to 0.4%. So from 0.9, it drops to 0.4. It's an important element when you're looking at policies for right now. So that's a drop of 0.5%, and most of that came from a negative total factor productivity for Japan. Negative. So if you are looking at policies, let's put in the resources, the investments into pushing the creativity, the technological innovations in Japan. And I would do some comparisons because you want to compare. I would compare it with Germany. And if you look at in German uh, with the economy, it was the opposite in, ter in terms of total factor productivity. They had a positive 0.5% growth rate. Japan had a negative 0.4% growth rate. So, lessons to learn. In terms of comparisons, I'm not ranking, so don't get me wrong, I'm not ranking them. I'm just sort of saying, you compare kind of similar economies, you know, after the world, Second World War, very high growth rates, very high industrialization processes. So you want to sort of see 
the kind of similarities. So in order to uh, make the sustainable development into concrete measures, it is very important to highlight on this point. Therefore, the Inclusive Wealth Report, uh, what it lies in the basis of the report is to clarify uh, the, the paradigm shift of the, uh, the development. So uh, it has multiple meanings within this report. So in terms of this productive base then, it forms the basis for sustainable development. Therefore, the productive base, sometimes we call this as inclusive wealth, unless we have the productive base, we cannot prepare the conditions to develop the inclusive wealth. So according to this report, this is a 2012 version, inclusive wealth framework provides information for policymakers on which, on which forms of capital investment should be made for ensuring the sustainability of the productive base. So this is the, uh, the terminology that has been uh, mentioned within the report. So what exactly is this productive base that could be explained through capital assets? So we have the list of capital assets, for instance, reproducible capital assets. We have the human assets, natural capital, and so forth. Especially in 2012, there was much focus on natural capital. So the point I'd like to highlight here is the fact that uh, these capital assets, when we consider the capital assets, productive base does not only provide the, provide the access to the people. So it is not only the capital assets to which people there have access, but also the soci social infrastructure, the influence that influences the way those assets are put to work for human use. So that is just as important. So they classify those as different, but they put equal importance on both of those ideas. Therefore, the Inclusive Wealth Index, when we consider inclusive wealth, it is an idea uh, to keep the sustainable development so that the wealth would not depreciate uh, between uh, generations. So that is the way to measure uh, the productivity. So I think the key concept to highlight here, so this could be also an economic concept, is this concept of shadow price. So let's just say there are assets. But still, we need to understand the value, the price, the social value that is attached to those assets. We need to address those. And shadow price will be the ways to address that value. So this is not the, even if the, the natural uh, asset may be transacted within the mark, market, the market price does not necessarily reflect the, the true value of the asset. So quite often, it is different. It, di it diverges uh, from the, the market price. So there are a couple frameworks for inclusive wealth and sustainable development. I believe the framework itself has advanced quite significantly in the, in the past years. But I believe there are a number of challenges still need to be met or issues. So we have just started to measure the inclusive wealth. So that is why uh, the issues have become much more accentuated. So of course these issues have been in existence historically, but because now we ha are starting to measure those, it has become much more highlighted. So in terms of shadow price, how do we price the shadow price? That is one major issue that we need to address. And as mentioned already, let's just say the even some a natural asset may hire the market to transact. However, uh, they, might, they might be a market, but the shadow price might not necessarily match the, the market price. But quite often, the natural capital, they may not have any market price at all. 
So if that's the case, how should we price them uh, with the shadow price? That is an issue. Another point, some cases, some assets may not have the, the property of right. So the issue with shadow price, uh, the fact that it has externalities, denotes that there's a divergence between market price and the shadow price. So because there has not been a clear mechanism to fully utilize the natural capital, uh, therefore uh, we see a divergence between, a gap between the shadow price and market price. But of course, as mentioned already, some of the natural capital may not have the market price in the beginning. In Japan, we do have natural capital. And we do have a number of uh, valuable activities underway to protect those natural capital. I think one of the representative uh, example is in Kesen Numa, uh, was in Miyagi Prefecture. Uh, this is a slogan called "Forest is longing to the sea, and sea is longing to the uh, the forest." Basically, the idea idea here is the fishermen, in order to protect their fish ground, they need to also protect the forest, and therefore the fishermen. They started to conduct uh, activities to plant the trees. So this is really the measure in consideration of the ecosystem. So the way we measure uh, the capital is quite separate. We, we try to measure the resources by uh, the oceanic resources as opposed to forestry resources. But there is definitely a connectivity here. So within Kyoto University, we do have a study called Connectivity of Hills and Humans and Sea. So within our university, we do have a, a, a school of uh, studies uh, to address uh, that is inclusive of the human activities. So we do have an issue to consider the shadow price for these particular assets. And that is obviously goes beyond the, uh, the boundaries of nations. Another point to highlight already, uh, Professor Dasgupta mentioned, is related to enabling assets and social infrastructure, issues related to these. So we call it the, uh, the social uh, related assets or social environment. This is very much related to the, uh, the system and institutions. So let's just say if it's the same natural capital, in some cases, may have those natural capital. If they're used in a highly trusted society, uh, that is quite different if it were to be used in an environment where there's not much trust between among people. So the shadow price is bound to differ depending on the environment, depending on the infrastructure. Therefore, the enabling assets denote the capability to realize the uh, the value of the or the price of the uh, the the assets. So therefore, the enabling assets pose an impact on the the shadow price. So that is another issue we need to address. So if that's the case, if we were to consider investment into capital, so capital investment. It entails not just an investment on natural capital, but also it needs to reflect the investment into enabling assets. So personally, I believe we should also consider that aspect as well. So that is very much related to the Inclusive Wealth Framework, NSD, or Sustainable Development. I think time is up. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. So I'd like to leave time for the Q&A session and discussion. Um, a professional question, but anyone, please. So now I'd like to ask you to answer. Uh, question, four questions. And the first one is the uh, uh, relationship between the development concept and the uh, uh, ordinary people. <laughs> so uh, yeah, could you, uh, you, you can. May I, um, I think it may be most efficient if uh, I took all three and then Anand could take all three. Okay. If, if, yes. I, not, when I say all three, I may not have uh, Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me from here? Thank you very much. These are all uh, very fine questions, and I don't know that I'll be able to answer them or respond to them adequately. But the first, the uh, lady who spoke first. 
please note that we are all ordinary people. There's nothing special about you. <laughs> and these things matter to us on our daily lives. What you asked is a profoundly important, profound question, actually. I think I'm not sure that we understand how profound it is. And here's why. You, we, as citizens, care about our family, our children, our grandchildren, those of us who have grandchildren. We care about our friends. It's very hard to care about people in distant countries. It's, that's a psychological um, limitation. That's a very understandable limitation. You cannot love everybody in, lo in the world. If you did that, then you're, in some sense, you're missing out the idea of love. It can be confined to a few people only. But you should care about other people. That is to say, not harm them. All right. Um, the trick in a good society is to relieve ordinary people, which is everybody, from the responsibility of thinking about everybody else every time he or she does something. That's very important, because if, if you take a step and you say, how am I affecting the world, then you'll be paralyzed. You won't be able to do anything. Societies have tried to evolve institutions which take on the burden of making those decisions which affect others, so that you and I, when we go about our daily lives, do not have to think about others. We think about ourselves. When you go shopping, you think about what your household needs. You don't worry about what your neighbor needs and so forth. And it works. The problem is that with natural capital, it doesn't quite work. So we, the entire reason we are working, Professor Ueta, with his workshop, wonderful workshop that he has, he's been building it up uh, at the University of Kyoto, Zurapa and myself in a sort of shadowy kind of way, we're trying to get natural capital to be included in that class of things which we don't have to worry about. But at the moment, we do have to worry about it because nobody's paying any attention. That is to say, our authorities aren't paying attention. And that is why we ordinary people should protest against governments, businesses, in not joining us into thinking about it. The interpreter is not getting the audio. The about, could you understand what I said? Uh, I would appreciate if you would uh, wait uh, for the answer to finish. Second, the question that was raised was on catastrophic risks, because it was an event that took place which had devasta played devastation, had a devastation effect on the local communities and then spread far. The accident I'm talking about now. Now, the way we think about it is that when there are certain activities which have the potential, for maybe small risk, but nevertheless, the risk itself is large. I mean, when it takes place, the event is a large one. That's what we, we usually call, the, we call these risks catastrophic risks. The risk is small. Unfortunately, when it happens, it's large. Large in the sense that the, it affects a lot of people and a lot of damage. There are ways of thinking about it. And it is not, catastrophic risks haven't yet been absorbed in risk analysis mm. in any proper way yet. And it may be that it's an insoluble problem. And the reason it is inso maybe insoluble is that it's like the, you know, the uh, paradox of the um, irresistible force applied to an immovable object. There's a contradiction here, right? If it's irresistible, it should be able to move something, everything. But on the other hand, if something is immovable, there is no force that can move it. So there is a contradiction. It's the kind of contradiction that the Greeks, ancient Greeks, used to love creating. Catastrophic risks have that feature because the probability of the risk, I mean, of, of the event happening is tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. On the other hand, when it does happen, 
It's a big one, large one. Multiply the two, what does the number look like? It's hard to tell. Small variations in the estimates of either is going to make a huge difference to the product. And that is why we, I don't think we'll ever have a satisfactory notion of what to do about catastrophic risk. And I think beyond that point, it's best not to pretend that we can enumerate everything. It'll be on, based on a hunch and political power, unfortunately. And that's why probably uh, your question was so relevant, because uh, it should be us deciding in some sense, not the entrepreneur, not the political leader, because it's our lives which are at risk. But if you were to quantify it, that product would be part of the shadow price of the action. So if, if the action is taken, or it's part of the agenda, that it might trigger a catastrophic risk, then there should be a huge price attached to that action. Sufficient to, in the insurance literature, it would mean basically you should add the premium, insurance premium. Now here, of course, these risks, uh, these, uh, the, the damage could be so large that you, can't, you may not be able to insure it, but you can think of it as a shadow insurance. It'll be part of the shadow price. Um, I think the third question is, again, I have no satisfactory answer. The question arose, uh, the issue, the, the comment was that psychological factors ought to be included, and the answer is, of course, they should be included. It goes without saying. Our sense of how important the future is is going to affect shadow prices. It's going to affect the way we value the assets. If we don't care about the future, then you'll have a low shadow prices in the sense that you wouldn't be so worried about whether you're degrading your uh, assets or not. Now, here's a problem. This is something that, and I'll conclude with this, a problem that I think you may have thought about yourself. In this, there is a sense in which philosophers and social thinkers have no business to tell the ordinary person how he or she should think about the next generation. Because the ordinary person thinks about the next generation all the time. You educate your children, you nurture them, you feed them, you give them away to their spouses and their grandchildren and so forth. So where's the problem? The problem lies in the fact that our activities affect other people too. In other words, my activity affects not only my children, which, and then I take care of that, because I care about my children, but it probably affects other people's children too. And I may not take that too seriously. And of course, it's happening with the other persons as well, which is why this sustainability issue is really concerned with collective action, because of these intergenerational externalities. And the final point is that sustainable development doesn't mean optimal development. It's a very minimal requirement of development. It's asking, don't jeopardize the next generation. Give them at least as much as we had inherited ourselves. It doesn't say what is the right amount that we should leave for them. It may be more than simply handing over the amount. We may decide that we would like to leave more. Just as parents very often say to themselves, it'll be nice if our children had a better standard of living than we did ourselves. And our behavior very often is in, along that line. We try to leave for them more than we had ourselves, a lot more maybe. Okay, so that's, the, I think there is a difference between optimal and, and uh, um, sustainable. Well, thank you very much for the uh, very comprehensive answer. So, uh, Professor Durayapa, I think there was a, a question as to how did you calculate the value of forest? And uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Professor Ueta, you could touch upon Fukushima's. So I think there were, um, could you relate to the two previous questions? I'll, I'll take a stab at that valuation question, but before that, um, I was intrigued by the question from the, uh, from the lady on, on my left. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the fact of an ordinary person and what they can do, I want to point towards uh, the, the, one of the capitals, the, the human capital. Now that primarily is very much uh, 
going to be very dependent on the education systems that we have. And, and, and if you, and we, we get the education system right, uh, it actually can produce a lot of positive externalities, um, which would then take into a, an impact on the way we would value our natural capital um, over, over this generation as well as in the future. But what we have right now uh, within our education system is in, in terms of, it's a very, uh, what I would sort of say, a very output driven kind of a system where we kind of train um, our, our students in, in to, to produce and to produce it efficiently and to increase that over time. So that's your focus on technology and stuff. Um, which is important. I, I'm not discounting that at all. And uh, we call it what we call the banking system of education. But to add with that, and there's a big movement right now at the international level, is to bring in a more humanistic for, uh, perspective towards education. Uh, some of the things that Professor Dasgupta uh, alluded in his, uh, in his response, in bringing in the whole notion of a moral imperative into the education system, the notion of responsibility, um, accountability, reflexivity, in terms of to reflect continuously. And I think with that understanding, the whole notion of, as we say, the world is getting much smaller, we are, much, we are getting so much more interconnected. We are, in a way, global citizens. Uh, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, it all depends. It's not all in the, like 200 years ago, very lo locally sourced. And so we are very interdependent. And to think not about, uh, and to not think about the implications on somebody who's living 4,000 kilometers away, it, it's, it's no longer an option. One has to yeah, within decisions. And, and that comes through an education system that, is, that needs to be changed, revised, to our contemporary problems. And I think that's, that's important. In the evaluation, I'll do a very quick, in the economic literature, we have a number of uh, techniques that we used for trying to get those shadow prizes. Uh, one of it, uh, you know, the two big ones, uh, just, I will use this jargon very close, very loosely. Revealed preference would be one, where we actually s find that through, uh, other types of prizes, like the value of a particular uh, uh, a lake based on the house prices around the lake kind of goes up, and that kind of gives you a, the aesthetic value and, of that particular landscape and stuff. So that's one. Then stated, another way is stated is actually we go out and ask people, you know, what are you willing to pay or how much are you willing to accept uh, in terms of uh, changes in a particular environmental asset. And the third one, which is now getting a little bit much more common, is experimental uh, studies. And that goes towards more in terms of how to really capture the psychological uh, impacts uh, or the psychological factors. And it depends very much on how you design those experiments. But they're kind of inter providing some in interesting results where it highlights the notion of uh, an inconsistency of the value systems and how one deals with that and then comes up with some kind of a value for that particular asset. Thank you. Yeah, sensei and So Professor Ueta, would you uh, would you kindly answer the, the question? Related to Fukushima. There was a question related to Fukushima. Actually the issues related to reconstruction of Fukushima and to relate this to sustainable development. So we, we need to consider reconstruction with the concept of sustainable development. We believe that is an important criteria uh, to measure the reconstruction. So personally, I believe it is important to take that into consideration. So what, what do I mean by that? So with the Fukushima incident, what were the damages? What were the devastation? So today we have been talking about the human well-being. How can we enhance the human well-being on a sustainable basis? In this case, the productive base to enable that has been devastated by the incident. This is how we should interpret this incident. 
Therefore, what sort of damage was posed to the productive base? Or to put another way, the reconstruction efforts is, in a way, how we can reconstruct those productive base. We need to fully understand this concept. And based on that understanding, we need to devise and also execute the reconstruction plans. So I believe what is challenging here is the fact the, uh, the state prior to the incident, prior to the earthquake, we need to assess whether that was sustainable to start off with. We need to analyze. Uh, so we cannot say we should go back to where we were before because we need to understand whether uh, the pre-crisis or pre-incident was sustainable or not. That is one point. Also, the second point relates to natural resources. For instance, uh, the, the aqua uh, resources. So uh, um, maybe the overall output, um, the number of fish have not declined, but there's not much means to catch those fish. For instance, we have lost many uh, fishing vessels. So uh, it is very difficult to evaluate that. So chances are, once we are able to reconstruct the means, we should be able to bring about the reconstruction or the outcome. Another point, the land has been contaminated with radiation. So it seems as if we have much liabilities because of the contaminated land. So the question is how we should address this. So what sort of changes could we bring about by addressing this issue? So these are some of the challenges we need to address. That's all. Thank you very much. I believe there are many more questions, as we can see from uh, the hands been risen. But because of the limitation of time, unfortunately, we would have to conclude the Q&A session. So within this concept of inclusive wealth, how would that be manifested in everyday life? And what sort of ideas could we bring about in Fukushima? And also, we talked about the uh, the forest account. How could that be reflected in everyday policy? All in all, each one of them is a very important idea, important issue. So that would take us a lot of time to discuss on each one of them extensively. So anyways, thank you very much for all your valuable questions. And with that, we would like to conclude the Q&A session. All the presenters, professors are here at the venue. So if you have any uh, follow-up questions, please take them offline. So could you give a round of applause to uh, the three professors?